Good morning and welcome. My name is Candace Patton and I'm the Executive Director for Clean Technology at Alberta Innovates. I am so excited to bring you the first session in our Small Modular Reactors Learning Learn How series. Alberta Innovates is the innovation engine for the province of Alberta. When a new technology has the potential to benefit Alberta, our teams get excited to explore the opportunities and challenges that those technologies may present. We love to share knowledge, open up connections for good conversation around energy and clean tech. So we hope this series is gonna spark ideas for you. Alberta Innovates is a member of the action plan for small modular reactors. And if I can quote the vision, uh, we're looking for small modular reactors to be a source of safe, clean, affordable energy, opening up opportunities for a resilient, low carbon future and capturing benefits for Canada and Canadians. This series is an opportunity for Albertans to discover nuclear technology and to hear more about the action plan, safety and regulations and innovation in Canada's nuclear industry. We've got four sessions over the next four weeks to share with you. Today is SMR 101, and I'm so pleased to welcome our speakers. Deanne Cameron for Natural Resources Canada, John Gorman, the President and CEO of the Canadian Nuclear Association, and Marcel DeVos from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Next week in session two, we're going to feature voices from New Brunswick, Ontario and Saskatchewan to talk about some of the exciting innovation happening around SMRs in Canada, lessons learned so far and how provinces are coordinating to understand opportunities around these technologies. The third session on March 2nd will feature Ron Oberth from the Organization of Canadian Nuclear Industries to talk about potential industrial opportunities for Alberta and a technology showcase featuring nine companies with different SMR technologies so you can learn a little bit about each one. Finally, our fourth session on March 9th will get into community engagement and conversations around energy transition. I hope you can join us for many more of these sessions. I've got a few housekeeping items before we kick off. We will be recording the webinar and it will be available along with the presenter slides after the session. We wanna hear from you as well. So please feel free to use the group chat to say hello, let us know where you're joining from. And I'd love to hear what drew you and what uh, piqued your interest for the session today. During the presentations, if you've got a question for, your, uh, for our speakers that you'd like me to ask them at the end, use the Q&A button at the bottom to submit a question. You can let me know who you want to direct your question to, or if you'd like, leave it open for the speakers to answer together. You can also use the Q&A if you need help with a technical question. Our comms team will be looking out for any issues you have. At the end, if we don't have time to get to your question, we will be capturing them all and give our speakers a chance afterwards to respond to them, and we'll post the, uh, the responses with the presentation materials after. If you're not already using Google Chrome, that is the browser we recommend for the best viewing experience here. All right, let's dive into our first presentation from Deanne Cameron. Deanne Cameron is currently the director of the Nuclear Energy Division at Natural Resources Canada. As director, she heads up the division responsible for leading and coordinating Canadian public policy on nuclear energy. Ms. Cameron serves as the chair of the Canadian Roadmap and Action Plan for Small Modular Reactors. She received a Master's in Technology and Policy from MIT, where she was named the Alfred Keel Fellow for Wiser Uses of Science and Technology. Ms. Cameron also holds a Bachelor of Applied Science in Systems Design Engineering from the Water of, uh, University of Waterloo. So Deanne, I will pass the virtual mic over to you to start your presentation. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and hello everybody. <clears throat> Thank you, Candace. I am Deanne Cameron. I'm the director of the Nuclear Energy Division. Um, and in this role, it is my distinct pleasure and privilege to oversee the team that leads and convenes nuclear, nuclear energy policy for uh, Canada in close collaboration with provinces and territories, including Alberta and utilities, as well as industry, and increasingly in conversation with uh, heavy industry stakeholders like uh, mining and oil sands uh, and civil society, of course, uh, in an ongoing and respectful uh, discussion with Indigenous peoples across Canada. Um, next slide, please, to, the, to slide number two. I'm going to structure my talk today in three parts. I'm going to start with a bit of context on Canada's climate change policies before turning to nuclear energy in Canada broadly, and then honing in and focusing on small modular reactors. Next slide, please. So here, I'd like to set out with a little bit. Of, start out with a little bit of context um, about. Canada 
Canada's climate change policy framework and our objectives on climate change. In 2020, the Government of Canada released its Strengthened Climate Plan. This built on the momentum of the 2016 Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change and our original commitments that we made in 2015 under the Paris Agreement to reduce emissions. The Strengthened Climate Plan, released in 2020, invests an additional $15 billion in clean energy investments and puts a higher price on carbon, rising to $170 per tonne of carbon dioxide by 2030. The strengthened plan is supported by, strong, by a strong policy framework, and that includes a variety of, uh, of individual pillars and initiatives, including the new clean fuel standard, a hydrogen strategy for Canada that includes uh, an aspect on nuclear hydrogen, and also Canada's new Small Modular Reactor Action Plan, which we'll be talking about later today. Turning to the next slide, please. Just to drive home this, this climate change context for our discussion, I'd like to highlight a report that was released by the International Energy Agency in 2019. The International Energy Agency is a body of the OECD. It's an international organization. It's one of the highest level international think tanks, if you will, in one sense, that does analysis and provides advice and provides the evidence base on climate change and clean energy for policymakers at the highest level around the world. And the International Energy Agency, the IEA, released its first report on nuclear energy in 2019, first report in over 20 years. <coughs> this was a ground moving report for us. It really brought home um, and, and raised the profile of some key analysis. And I'd like to highlight two key conclusions that it drew. And one of the conclusions is that the risk of failure, outright failure, um, for the world in our efforts to meet our climate change objectives is significantly higher if we attempt to do so without nuclear. But even if we were to succeed in meeting our emissions reductions targets and our two degree scenario objectives without nuclear, it would cost the world 1.6 trillion US dollars more to do so without nuclear than with nuclear, which is approximately the size of the Canadian economy, just to put that in perspective. So we know that nuclear has a vital role to play in addressing climate change. Turning to the next slide, I'd like to provide a bit of context now, an overview of nuclear in Canada. The first thing to note is that Canada is really good at nuclear. Not many Canadians know this, we were the second country to achieve the ability of criticality, which is this step, this key step in actually generating nuclear energy. We were the first country to declare that we would use nuclear only for peaceful purposes. Approximately one quarter of our Nobel prizes in Canada are related to nuclear science. We are one of a very small and very elite group of countries, only eight in the world, with the type of capabilities that we have in Canada in nuclear. We're the world's second largest producer of uranium, and we provide from our nuclear power plants more than half of the world's supply of a radioisotope called cobalt-60, which is used in cancer treatment, and it's also been critical in the pandemic response because it is used in the sterilization of medical equipment like PPE. Turning to the next slide, from the perspective of the federal government of Canada, nuclear is more than just one of several options for generating non-emitting electricity. A critical and strategic asset. We have a pan-Canadian industry from which we derive significant economic, geopolitical, public health, and environmental benefits. The nuclear sector in Canada contributes 17 billion in GDP and supports 76,000 jobs there are over 200 small and medium-sized enterprises in the Canadian nuclear supply chain. Nuclear supplies about 15% of Canada's electricity. I already mentioned that our nuclear power plants produce medical isotopes. Nuclear in Canada offsets over 50 million tons of carbon dioxide every year. It's absolutely essential for our climate plan and to reach our Paris targets. 
It is also a beachhead for strategic international engagement from a geopolitical perspective. Turning to the next slide. Now I'd like to, I'd like to come to the topic of the day, which is a really exciting topic, small modular reactors. But before I go any farther, let me just quickly take a moment to define what it is that we're talking about when we say SMR, small modular reactor. Just as the name implies, they are smaller, uh, smaller both in terms of physical size and in terms of power output than the can-do reactors that we already operate in Canada today. They're modular, which means they're meant to be factory produced. And the modularization of that construction process, turning, bringing things from stick building construction into a manufacturing modularization using the benefits of the additive manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, those are some of the ways uh, that the industry intends to drive down the costs. And they're also modular in the sense that they're stackable or scalable. So if you had a small modular reactor that was uh, maybe five megawatts electric size, this, the kind of unit that would fit, that would roll off of a production line, just like we produce, we manufacture pickup trucks, and then we'd ship them to site or we, we, we truck them or put them on a train or put them on a barge, we would do the same thing with these modular, these small modular reactors, deliver them to site. Um, if you had a mine site, for example, or a heavy resource site that needed, let's say 30 megawatts electric uh, power, uh, and you had these five megawatt electric units, well, you could deploy six of them, or you could actually deploy seven or eight or even nine of them, create some redundancy in your own system uh, which could allow you, if you're off-grid, not only to phase out your primary diesel, but also potentially your backup diesel. They are reactors, so small and modular and reactors. By reactor, what we mean is that somewhere at the middle of these things, there is um, a nuclear fission reaction that is generating heat. So nuclear fission is the process at the atomic level of splitting the atom. Um, which is that criticality I talked about, where Canada was the second country in the world to figure out how to do that. So nuclear fission creates heat, and we can use the heat directly as process heat in industrial applications. And um, we can use the heat for district heating or for desalination or to produce hydrogen. There's lots of ways to use the heat directly, or you can use the heat, and if you want, to generate electricity. So. Couple key points here. So an SMR technically is defined as anything that produces less than 300 megawatts electric. A current can-do reactor, the kind we have in Canada and Ontario and New Brunswick produces, it's a gigawatt scale reactor. So on the order of a thousand megawatts electric. So an SMR is anything less than a third that size. But even within that range, there's a range of sizes, which we're gonna unpack in a little while. For anywhere from 300 megawatts electric, which is it gets a bit silly because we start talking about large small modular reactors down to very small modular reactors in that five scale. So it's it's sort of like vehicles where, you know, if you say I, I need to buy a vehicle, that's not specific enough. You could be talking about a motorcycle, you could be talking about a pickup truck, you'd be talking about a semi. And so same thing with SMRs, it's still a pretty big category. Turning to the next slide, this is one of my favorite slides. Um, this is artwork that was commissioned by an environmental NGO called Third Way, which is based out of Washington, D.C. And uh, they hire, and we have permission to use their, we have permission to use their artwork. And um, they asked an artist to imagine and to depict what SMRs might look like as they are deployed into these new applications and new settings. Uh, and, and so be because they are, because they are smaller, they're more modular, and they're going to be able to break into new applications and new markets and new contexts um, that large nuclear was never able to support. And so what's shown here, top left-hand corner, is a data center. So we are all increasingly running our lives off of the digital economy, phones, uh, telework, and the data centers that are the backbone of that digital economy are power hungry, and they require an enormous amount of electricity. And when those data centers are located in jurisdictions like California that still burn coal, that has a significant impact on climate. So what the artist is imagining here is that a data center is powered by a combination of SMRs and wind. Uh, when the wind is blowing, the wind uh, electricity is being used. And when the wind isn't blowing, the 
the SMRs are dynamically load following and providing the power needed for uh, for that data center, making a significant impact on uh, emissions reductions. Bottom left-hand corner. Personally, my least favorite picture, but still a very important concept. I just, it's visually not as appealing, but it's a very important concept. This is an SMR for heavy industry. So this is exactly the scenario we were just talking about. Any heavy industry application that requires high temperature heat. We all know that it's very inefficient and very expensive to turn electricity back into heat, which is why there's a market for, for natural, gas, natural gas co-generation, combined heat and power. Um, in industries like uh, steel, like cement, like uh, pulp and paper, like SAG D in the oil sense, and um, where you need that high temperature heat. And so SMRs are really the only emerging technology that promises to provide or has the potential to provide a non emitting co gen solution to compete with natural gas, um, which is going to open up these new parts, these get us access to these otherwise hard to abate parts of the economy. Uh, top right hand corner, a micro SMR in a remote northern community, providing not only electricity, but providing district heating and heating for a greenhouse to increase food security. They can run a greenhouse year round, fresh tomatoes year round, that kind of a thing. Bottom right hand corner is an energy park. The idea that's illustrated here is the idea of tightly coupling a variety of different technologies um, like geothermal, wind, and solar with SMRs, having them dynamically linked so that when the wind and the sun, wind is blowing and the sun is shining, that's where you're deriving your electricity from. You're using pumped, pumped, um, excuse me, pumped hydropower uh, as a blue battery uh, to save the electricity from, uh, from your SMR when the wind is blowing. Uh, when the wind is not blowing, you're using your SMR, you're drawing down your blue hydrogen, um, and you're using that for a variety of purposes. Uh, desalination, irrigation, electricity, and you're creating a, a, a lush environment for people. Uh, turning to the next slide. So turning from sort of nuclear in the imagination to nuclear uh, here on uh, in reality in Canada, uh, through analysis and market, uh, mar market analysis and stakeholder engagement, we've identified three discrete markets for, for SMRs in Canada ranging from, at the left-hand side, large end of the spectrum, uh, coal replacement, basically. These are uh, SMRs that are at the large end of that scale, 300 megawatts electric, uh, replacing coal and generating electricity on a grid. The main value proposition is electricity on a grid. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, remote communities. Here we're talking about units that are on the order of two to five megawatts electric. And there is demand there for the over 200 communities in Canada that currently rely almost 100% on diesel and are looking for alternatives to replace diesel. There are some communities in Canada that are interested in including SMRs in their decision making as, an, as, as a viable alternative to diesel. And then in the middle is probably the sweet spot for Canada, a niche that we can really step into because we are both a world leading nuclear power, but we're also a resource extraction and resource processing um, superpower. And so here we're talking about that co-gen combined heat and power for heavy industry applications. Turning to the next slide. This is a slide from Canada's SMR roadmap in 2018, where we did an analysis of the size of the domestic market. Again, that combination of grid scale for electricity, remote communities, and also heavy industry. And we estimate uh, that the size of the market will yield up to $19 billion in total annual economic impact between 2030 and 2040, creating about 6,000 new jobs per year. Next slide, please. And the international market is estimated to be gigantic, um, reaching over 150 to $300 billion per year by 2040. Now turning to slide 12, some of you may already be familiar with Canada's SMR roadmap. It was a project we undertook in 2018, and it is the focal point for developing, for the development of Canada's SMR strategic policy framework. A pan-Canadian team oversaw expert analysis, technical workshops, and engagement sessions across the country, country to produce the evidence base that would inform our vision and our approach to SMRs in Canada. Turning to the next slide, and now coming to Canada's SMR Action Plan. In 2020, we took the next step. We reconvened a pan-Canadian initiative to build 
to develop Canada's SMR action plan, building on the momentum of the roadmap, where the, where the roadmap articulated a vision as to what we want to achieve. The action plan sets out the guiding principles, how we want to achieve the vision. Where the roadmap set out 53 recommendations for action, the action plan responded to all those recommendations with nearly 500 commitments for action that go well beyond the original recommendations of the roadmap. Where the roadmap initiated Indigenous engagement and dialogue, in the action plan, we commit, and as do other partners, we commit to a continued um, meaningful ongoing engagement. In 2018, 55 organizations across Canada contributed to the roadmap. Turning to the next slide, you can see that in the action plan, over 110 partners joined us in the action plan from across Canada, from Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, New Brunswick, PEI, the Yukon, and Nunavut, including federal, provincial, territorial, and municipal governments, Indigenous partners, industry, and civil society. All of Canada's action plan partners endorsed a vision, committed to the principles, and are taking action to turn our roadmap vision into reality. Turning to the next slide, and this will be my last slide, our vision situates SMRs within the broader national priorities on climate change, but also on innovation, and also on climate change, I'm sorry, I already said climate change, but good jobs in economic recovery. So please check out our SMR Action Plan at smractionplan.ca. And our vision, and we hope that you, you, you agree, is to develop and deploy SMRs in Canada as a safe source of clean, affordable energy, opening opportunities for a resilient, low-carbon future, and capturing benefits for Canada and communities. And, and in the interest of time, uh, I'll share with you the, the slide on the three streams, and we can address that in Q and A. Uh, but I'd like to uh, I'd like to conclude now by just thanking you and looking forward to the. Day. Thank you so much, Thank Deanne. You. I've been seeing the questions coming in from the audience and we're going to have some time at the end to answer them. So if you've got more questions for Deanne, please keep sending them in using the Q&A box below. There have been a few questions coming in about the slides and the presentation. The webinar is being recorded and will be available after the session, as will the slides. And if we don't get to your question today, we'll also give the speakers a chance to answer it um, after the program and post those as well. Our next speaker, John Gorman, is the president and CEO of the Canadian, uh, sorry, of the Canadian Nuclear Association. Prior to joining the CNA, John served as president and CEO of the Canadian Solar Industries Association, CANSIA, the National Trade Association for Canada's Solar Energy Industries. John serves as Canada's designate to the International Energy Agency and sits on the executive of the Canadian Council on Renewable Energy. John's been recognized as one of Canada's Clean 50 and is the recipient of the 40 Under 40 Business Award for Excellence in Business Practices. He was also awarded the designation of Climate Project Ambassador by Nobel Laureate Al Gore in 2008. John, we're looking forward to hearing more about SMR opportunities for Alberta from you now. Thank you very much, Candice. And uh, thanks to Alberta Innovates for putting together uh, such, a, such a, 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 an interesting um, set or series of uh, webinars. We're really excited to be, uh, to be a part of this. Um, and uh, I'd also, uh, well, I'd also like to give a shout out to uh, Deanne Cameron, uh, who, uh, you know, has been such a champion uh, for nuclear uh, in Canada and, and in particular of small modular reactors and for that presentation, which really um, laid out so many of the, the fundamental um, aspects of small modular reactors. Uh, and that's going to allow me to uh, be fairly brief on those uh, pieces and um, hopefully focus a bit on the, uh, on the Alberta market and, and uses in the Alberta uh, sector. So, Candice, why don't we go ahead to the first uh, slide. So small modular reactors, um, Deanne covered this uh, really well, right? You, you can think of these small modular reactors almost as... Um, almost as personal computers, distributed computing compared to mainframe computers, for those of you who, are, who remember the main, mainframe computers. I mean, the, the conventional nuclear plants uh, produce vast amounts of uh, clean uh, electricity, 
and they are major, major infrastructure projects, right? Um, uh, for example, right now we are refurbishing uh, the three, uh, the, um, the uh, nuclear plants in Ontario. It's a $26 billion um, infrastructure project that takes place over 10 years. Uh, it is uh, proceeding on time and on budget. It's going to ensure that Ontario continues to meet about two thirds of its electricity needs well into the 2060s. Uh, in a very cost competitive way, right? It's the it's the, the second cheapest form of electricity in in uh, Ontario, and it will continue to be so. And it comes in at about two thirds of the cost of uh, of residential electricity. So so very cost effective uh, these conventional plants. And uh, in in the case of uh, Canada, um, these these conventional nuclear plants. Um, enabled Ontario to replace about 90% of its coal. And uh, that is still the world's largest decarbonization uh, initiative. So conventional nuclear is a good thing, a big, large infrastructure project where these uh, small modular reactors are, are, are very uh, modular and distributable. And the other thing I'll say that um, uh, Deanne didn't uh, focus on too much is they're also very responsive. So they uh, are able to play very well with intermittent sources of electricity like uh, like wind and solar um, that need to be supported by uh, by something as a, as a base load. And small modular reactors like gas plants are able to ramp up and ramp down quite quickly. And that makes them a good partner for renewables. Um, next slide. So. Uh, one of the remarkable things about small modular reactors, and you know, as Candace said in the beginning, I, I come to nuclear uh, from the renewables side. I've been here for about a year and a half, and something I didn't fully appreciate about small modular reactors is that they are not just a form of electricity that is very scalable in terms of how much electricity you want, uh, but they are uh, a form of very high temperature clean heat and it's on the basis of this clean heat uh, that we're able to do a variety of things. Um, Deanne mentions some of them. I'm, you could desalinate water, for example, which is so important in some regions of the world. But in the Canadian context, you're using that very high temperature heat to produce uh, electricity, um, you know, primarily through steam, or else you're producing very, very high temperature steam that can be used in extraction industries, like the oil sands, for example, or uh, could be used to produce heat uh, in a mining situation as well as electricity. And of course, you could use either the electricity or the high temperature heat to produce hydrogen. So you have these very scalable uh, small modular reactors that can be small enough to be providing electricity and heat to a, a, a small northern community uh, or large enough to be attached to an electricity grid uh, producing um, you know, 300 megawatts of electricity and at the same time uh, be using the heat to do other things like produce hydrogen, et cetera. So very, very flexible, almost a tri-generation tri type technology uh, that we can use in the Canadian economy to help decarbonize some of those places that are so, uh, some of those industries that are difficult to decarbonize, whether it's uh, cement or uh, steel or uh, oil sands or mining operations, et cetera. Uh, next slide. So um, one thing I'd like to spend a little bit of time focusing on is uh, Canada's expertise in this area and the opportunity that we have right now as a nation and that Alberta has to be a first mover in small modular reactors, uh, to use the technology in regions across uh, Canada to uh, to meet the, the various needs of our economy. It's, a, it's about a $5.3 billion market just domestically here for small modular reactors. But uh, these provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, and New Brunswick, these four provinces, uh, the premiers of which have signed an MOU about the um, development and deployment of small modular reactors, these four prov provinces, including Alberta, really have the opportunity to participate in this um, sector, both domestically and uh, internationally. And as Deanne pointed out, that market uh, internationally 
for the deployment of small modular reactors is enormous, right? It's going to be somewhere between 150 and $300 billion a year uh, by the time we hit uh, the late 2030s. So a big, a big prize there. Now, why is Canada uh, in a position to be a first mover with small modular reactors? For some of the reasons that Deanne mentioned, um, of course, we've got a long history in nuclear. We're a tier one nuclear uh, nation. Uh, we've been operating plants successfully for over 60 years. Right now, they provide two thirds of the electricity in Ontario, a third of the electricity in in, uh, in New Brunswick. Uh, of course, we've got uh, an amazing uh, uranium uh, industry here. We're the second largest exporter of uranium uh, in the world, uh, primarily in Saskatchewan. Uh, right now, we've got uh, a top tier uh, nuclear laborato laboratory, the Canadian Nuclear Laboratory. Uh, and we're a leader in medical um, medical uses of nuclear as well, like isotopes, for for example. It's this this whole ecosystem, and interestingly, uh, we also have um, uh, we also have a competitive advantage in our regulator. Uh, our regulator is uniquely suited to be able to deal with innovative technologies like these small modular reactors. Uh, so uh, we have a speaker coming up, of course, who's, who's going to be able to speak to this. But whereas there are some regulators uh, in the U.S., for example, who might look at a technology in a very prescriptive way, so look at a new innovative technology from one of these companies you see on the screen here, for example, and say, well, you have to do it this way. Whereas, uh, whereas our regulator is um, more able to say, show us how your technology is going to be able to clear this particular hurdle. And that allows for good innovation. And it's the reason that we have 12 different SMR technologies going through the review and licensing process right now. So I'd say the CNSC, our regulator, is a competitive advantage. I'll just say one more thing. Um, Deanne spoke about the leadership of the federal government on this, the SMR roadmap, the SMR action plan, which of course Alberta Innovates uh, signed on to. Um, these things have been very, very important for making industry and uh, the rest of the sector join together and have a very coordinated approach to rolling out these small modular reactors. Um, as a result, we have four major utilities uh, now in Canada that have agreed to a plan for the development and deployment of these small modular reactors. We have the federal government now uh, firmly taking the position that nuclear is needed for our future and clean and is committed to working with the provinces and the premiers of Alberta, Ontario, New Brunswick and Saskatchewan to make this a reality. So. Things are looking very uh, positive for Canada as a first uh, mover right now. And of course, uh, Alberta being in that mix means that um, if you start using the expertise uh, and, and innovative approaches that you have, as well as your, your uh, various sectors like oil and gas, where these things can be applied, not only could you be making a more competitive uh, product going into the future from a carbon point of view, but developing that expertise that can help other nations. Next uh, slide, please. Um, so the, this plan uh, that we have for uh, the, the, the utilities and the industry rolling out small modular reactors, um, we've broken it into three streams. The, the first stream is uh, sort of uh, the larger uh, 300 megawatt reactor, which is going to be connected. Uh, Ontario Power Generation has said that it will connect it by 2028. Saskatchewan is has uh, commented publicly that it's going to follow with the same technology right behind Ontario to introduce small modular reactors by 2030, um, thereby allowing for uh, thereby allowing for uh, coal to be phased out and, and less gas plants to be built and more renewables to come online. We have another stream which is even more advanced reactors than this, which will be available a little bit later, and then a third stream uh, in the plan that is the smaller uh, small modular reactors, which can be used for off-grid applications such as mining, oil sands, remote communities. Even next slide. So why is Alberta interested? Well, uh, Minister Savage and uh, Premier Kenny, of course, uh, have primarily been talking about small modular reactors and their application to the oil sands operations. I think Premier Kenny has said that, uh, you know, if, if we're going to see uh, oil, um, uh, the use of oil diminish uh, over the years uh, because of carbon constraints, we want to see Alberta have 
uh, been producing that last uh, most competitive uh, barrel of oil and certainly small modular reactors and the very high temperature heat and steam can help uh, can help the the sector do that we've been doing some uh, research that has shown uh, a really a terrific adoption and um, uh, potential in the oil sands uh, because of uh, you know the the options that are available and, and for costs uh, next next slide So uh, the opportunity for uh, Alberta, of course, goes beyond just um, creating um, more competitive uh, oil in a carbon-constrained world, uh, but an opportunity to use this uh, long history of energy development that, that uh, Alberta has, uh, its, its expertise in innovation, um, the respect that it has uh, for, as, uh, globally for its research uh, sector, its educated and skilled work, force. These things can all be um, applied to uh, the, the nuclear sector, the small modular reactor sector to uh, bring a new dimension of uh, jobs and economic benefit to Alberta. I'd also say that you have, um, uh, you share with Saskatchewan the Athabasca Basin, uh, which is, yeah, I think, the largest uranium um, deposit in the world. And so there's a great potential there to expand uh, the mining uh, sector within Alberta. So uh, these first movers in Canada, along with Canada's first mover advantage, means that um, these provinces, including Alberta, will be able to create new jobs and high-tech innovations and export opportunities for SMRs around the world. I'm really pretty excited about Alberta's prospect of uh, being able to uh, roll these things out, deploy them in places like oil sands, and then be able to extend that uh, expertise to other nations and, 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 uh, and help them. Next slide. So I think uh, I think we've spoken about uh, I've spoken about this um, just how the high temperature heat can be used and how scalable they are to ensure that uh, they can be used to decarbonize um, every barrel of oil. But of course, there's the creation of electricity at the same time and hydrogen, which uh, is an exciting prospect for Alberta. Uh, next slide. So we know that uh, there are applications in northern and off-grid remote communities as well. Uh, communities like uh, La Crete and Buffalo Head Prairie, Paddle Prairie, Keg River, et cetera, that you know, uh, have to suffer routine natural gas shortages in the winter months. Um, so there's, there's some terrific opportunities there in northern uh, Alberta as well. Uh, last slide, please. So I just wanted to emphasize this, this point about hydrogen. Uh, Alberta, the, the Alberta government has been uh, quite quite clear um, that it wants to be a leader in the production of hydrogen going forward, not only for its own economy, but uh, but for the export potential and, and uh, to be able to supply hydrogen domestically. You've got some great uh, gas assets right now that can help do that. Small modular reactors uh, are going to be able to uh, add to that potential. Um, and as I said, do it in a way where it's not just being created to, um, to produce hydrogen, but perhaps uh, be helping uh, with high temperature steam and the oil and gas extraction at the same time, producing hydrogen and off cycles and electricity for all your needs. So you can use this clean uh, nuclear to be able to produce uh, hydrogen and, and uh, have Alberta really uh, meet its expectations and, and targets in terms of being a powerhouse in Canada for for producing cost-effective clean hydrogen. So that's it for me, Candice. Thank you so much, John. So appreciated. We've got questions flying in, so there's gonna be lots of, of other material for, uh, for you and Deanna Marcel to chew on at the end here. And just a reminder for, for those folks, we are recording the webinar and we will have the opportunity to answer questions that we don't get to today and provide them to you following uh, the, the session. So I, it's my, now I'd love to introduce our final speaker for today, Marcel DeVos. Marcel works for the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission as a licensing project officer the, for almost 15 years and has been exclusively involved in regulatory readiness for new build nuclear projects in Canada. He works within a team of specialists to study and address both technical and regulatory perspectives about SMR technologies in Canada nationally for more than 10 years and regularly contributes to the work of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Marcel is here today to give an overview of the CNSC to assure Canadians that any SMR projects in Canada will continue to meet the high standards of safety. 
connected in the public. So Marcel, I'll pass you the virtual mic uh, for your presentation. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. As Candace mentioned in her introduction, I'm here today to introduce you to Canada's nuclear safety regulator. The potential introduction of small modular reactor technologies and projects to Canada falls within our regulatory mandate. So I'm going to explain to you how we have readied ourselves to regulate over the past several years. Just checking to see if the slide is progressing. Candice, can you do the slide changes for me, please? The regulation of nuclear activities is a nat national responsibility, and our role covers all regulated activities from mining to waste management over their full project life cycle. In Alberta, the current most common types of licensees range from medical diagnostic and treatment applications to oil well logging and radiography used to ensure that, for example, welds and piping systems are of the highest quality. We also regulate the transport of nuclear substances and how sensitive technical information or technologies, which we call prescribed information, are exported. Next slide. Canada's nuclear regulator has been around in some form since 1946 and has continuously evolved not only with industry growth, but also with changing societal expectations of what a regulator should do. Our mandate is to regulate the use of nuclear energy and materials to protect health, safety, and of course, security in the environment. Two, using nuclear energy for peaceful purposes only, and we must demonstrate this on the world stage. The CNN C has a role to disseminate objective, scientific, technical, and regulatory information to stakeholders such as the public. This is a major part of our regulatory processes and day-to-day -day work. But there are some things that are certainly not part of our mandate. We do not promote the use of nuclear energy. Our role is to regulate whatever is proposed to be done in Canada. The CNSC does not select locations for potential nuclear activities, and we do not select technologies to be used in licensed activities. The CNSC does not participate in provincial and federal government energy policy, such as what types or mix of energy to use, or in provincial and federal government waste policies. And fungenous engagement and consultation are are part of our mandate, and they're a large part of our mandate, but we are, we are not responsible for Indigenous rights and treaty determination. Next slide. The CNSC's regulatory approach is focused on safety, security, and environmental protection, and is aligned with fundamental regulatory and safety principles established by the International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA. The IAEA conducts missions on a periodic basis to various countries, such as Canada, to confirm that Canada remains aligned and those reports are posted. Under our framework, licensees are directly responsible for managing regulated activities in a manner that protects health, safety, security, and the environment, and that the work that they do conforms with Canada's domestic and international obligations on the peaceful use of nuclear energy. The CNSC is accountable to Parliament and to Canadians for assuring that these responsibilities are properly discharged. The CNSC therefore ensures that regulated parties are informed about requirements and are provided with guidance on how to meet them, and then verifies that all regulatory requirements are and continue to be met. Next slide, please. The Commission of the CNSC is an administrative tribunal established and governed under specific legislation called the Nuclear Safety and Control Act. This means that they are a decision-making body along the lines of a court. This also means that they're an agent of the Crown with a duty to consult. Each of the members you see in the slide are appointed by the Governor and Council and bring different experiences, skills, and societal perspectives to the table. This means that the body of evidence sitting before the Commission for a decision will be viewed through different lenses pertinent to nuclear safety. The Commission is an independent regulatory body, but is still responsible to Canadians. 
and therefore reports to Parliament, because reporting through through the Office of the Minister of Natural Resources. But I would like to clarify the Commission does not report to the Minister. The conduct of hearings and meetings by the Commission are public and are webcast, and decisions are made that are made by the Commission are reviewable by federal court. Next slide. Making these regulatory decisions involves weighing many complex factors. As a result, the Commission has established a body of dedicated professionals to provide them with timely advice. My colleagues and I are commonly called CNSC staff. We have no special access to the Commission. We are a separate organization who communicate with the Commission through the same mechanisms used by the public and industry. We're composed of dedicated persons with diverse expertise ranging from scientific and technical knowledge through regulatory policy, communications, and Indigenous consultation. When an application for a license is submitted, our role is to assess that application and make recommendations to the Commission to inform their decision making. Once a license is granted, we verify compliance with the license and our regulations. For facilities such as nuclear power plants, we have dedicated inspectors who know and inspect those facilities for compliance. To maintain our expertise as technology and practice evolves, we execute regulatory research, and this helps us shape our approach to regulation in our requirements and guidance, which I'll speak to later. Next slide. On top of our headquarters in Ottawa, we have frontline staff located in four regional offices, including Calgary. Where there are major nuclear projects, such as the ones shown on the slide, we maintain site offices with dedicated inspectors. We have three site offices uh, at Chalk River Nuclear Laboratories in Ontario, at the three nuclear power, uh, sorry, we have site offices at the three nuclear power plant sites in Ontario and at the New Brunswick power site called Point Lepro Generating Station. Staff at our headquarters have a role to provide technical support and they work with the regional and site inspectors to perform compliance activities. Next slide. One nuclear power plant site is the Darlington Nuclear Generating Station, which is located in a municipality of Clarington, east of Toronto. The station contains four domestically designed Canada Deuterium Uranium, or CANDU, reactors that have each been safely producing 875 electrical megawatts of clean energy since the early 1990s. We refer to each reactor as a unit in our facilities. These, this station supplies approximately 20% of Ontario's electricity and each unit is progressively undergoing long-term refurbishment activities to be able to continue 55 components and upgrading systems with newer technologies to improve performance our regulatory role during refurbishment is to confirm that these upgrades are being conducted to a high degree of quality by the licensee and there's an expectation that there will be an overall improvement in station safety performance. Next slide. CNSC staff have been looking at small modular reactors for years in order to maintain a state of readiness to regulate if they are ever proposed to be used in Canada. We recognize that such reactors may introduce new technologies and features and that safety can be achieved in different ways. But under the Canadian regulatory framework, <clears throat> SMR simply fit into a spectrum of all the other reactors that exist in Canada from research reactors up to the large nuclear power plants. In other words, the term SMR has no official legal meaning. To understand how SMRs may be built or operated differently, we're currently in the process of actively reviewing five different designs under a technical feedback process called a vendor design review, which is performed before the licensing project for a project would ever proceed. There are other designs in the pipeline that will be reviewed once the vendors decide to proceed. As I will explain shortly, we do not license technologies in Canada. As a result, when we provide regulatory feedback to a reactor vendor, <clears throat> we cannot make regulatory decisions. Because there are no decisions being made, the Commission is not involved in these pre-licensing engagement activities. We give useful regulatory feedback and learn about these technologies. We use this vendor design review process to access vendors' proprietary information. Reactor technology, we post the overall results of the review on our website 
but we divulge publicly our sorry proprietary information. If one of these designs is referenced in a license application that is submitted to the commission, then a formal licensing process will proceed and the commission will make the licensing decision. Next slide. CNSC staff have noted that SMRs have many similarities with a number of the smaller reactors that have been built in the past all over the world, while recognizing that modern advancements are being proposed. For example, the first reactor facilities in the world were small, in the order of 100 to 300 megawatts electric in output per unit. These facilities were built on greenfield sites with very little infrastructure on them. And as a result, everything except the concrete was manufactured off-site and delivered by truck or barge to the location for assembly. In the photo on the left, we see the installation of the Calandria, which is a large reactor assembly, at the Douglas Point Generating Station in 1966. In modern terms, this would be referred to as a module. This first-of-a-kind 220-megawatt electric facility operated from 1967 until 1984 and demonstrated commercial grid-scale power generation in Canada for plants in the world to generate electricity commercially. In the photo on the right, the White Shell Reactor, which is located in Manitoba, was an ingenious test and research co concept that ran from 1965 to 1985, and it used an organic oil as a reactor coolant instead of water. In addition to materials testing over its lifetime, it was also used as a district heating system for the White Shell site. Next slide, please. In a more modern context, a company called Global First Power, or GFP, submitted a license application in March of 2019 for a license to prepare site for a reactor facility to be deployed on land at the Chalk River Laboratories in Ontario. According to GFP, the facility will provide either high quality heat or up to five megawatts of electrical power. Global First Power is co-owned by Ontario Utility, Ontario Power Generation, and the reactor vendor called Ultrasafe Nuclear Corporation, or USNC. This will be a full-scale commercial demonstration facility. Global First Power has indicated that it will be used to demonstrate the reactor concept, ability, gathering of technical experience, which learning, learning uh, with operating these plants is always a major concern, and supporting staff training and certification. The the diagram in the slide shows a conceptual cutaway of the reactor building and only represents a portion of the whole facility. The intent of the final commercial design would be to provide continuous supply for 20 years to the, to the site. The environmental assessment for this project is currently underway. This is an example of a potential design that could be used for mining or a very large community. Next slide. The existing Nuclear utilities in Ontario have announced a number of initiatives in, in support of SR deployment. At the Darlington New Nuclear Project site, just east of the existing Darlington Nuclear Generating Station, Ontario Power Generation holds a license to prepare site for the area that's indicated with an arrow in the diagram and is seeking to renew this license at a hearing in June of 2021. OPG announced last October that it is in the process of selecting potential grid-sized SMR technologies for this site and has down-selected three specific technologies while still not closing the door to potential others. On December 2nd of last year, OPG informed the CNSC of its intent to submit a license to construct application by March, the end of March of 2022, noting that this is still subject to approvals by the province of Ontario. Next slide. The licensing process is a systematic, comprehensive, and transparent process to come to a decision that regulated activities will be conducted safely. It includes significant opportunities for Indigenous consultation and public consultation at different parts of the process. For nuclear power facilities, we have described the entire process in a regulatory document called RegDoc 3.5.1, which can be found on our website. Our regulations require licenses for regulated activities involving preparation of a project site, construction of the facility, and the eventual decommissioning of the facility at the end of its life. 
we have established license application guides for each phase to explain what information needs to be submitted to support CNSC staff making a licensing recommendation to the Commission. An environmental assessment will be conducted for the entire project life cycle, and each license will need to confirm how the activities being proposed are meeting environmental protection requirements within the licensee's environmental protection program. Each phase of a project looks not only at the activities that will be performed under that license, but also at the long view. For example, under a license to prepare site, we look at how emergency planning infrastructure and land use planning will be maintained over the entire project life cycle. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, a licensee is the cornerstone of safety and is held accountable by their license. Any licensing decision by our commission requires the same ultimate conclusion, which is stated in section 24 of the Nuclear Safety Control Act. That is, no license may be issued, renewed, amended, or replaced unless, in the opinion of the Commission, the applicant is qualified to carry on the activity that the license will authorize the licensee to carry on, and in will, in carrying on that activity, make adequate provision for the protection of the environment, the health and safety of persons, and the maintenance of national security and measures required to implement international obligations to which Canada has agreed. To come to this conclusion, the Commission requires an applicant to demonstrate using sufficient evidence that these two factors are true in 14 safety and control areas addressed in the licensing process. In a nutshell, safety and control areas, or SCAs, are standardized topics that apply regardless of the type and size of a nuclear power facility project. License application guides are organized around these topics, which we assess during the licensing process. If the applicant is granted a license by the Commission, we will verify compliance and report on performance to the Commission using these topics. If I use an example of one of the, one of the safety and control areas shown on the, on the slide, namely security, an applicant is expected to explain how they will establish and maintain both the technological approaches in the plant design processes to ensure a high level of security. This includes making sure the security staff are appropriately qualified. Cybersecurity, for example, is a mix of technology approaches and controls, such as access by personnel to equipment for maintenance. Next slide, please. When CNSC staff assess an applicant uh, approaches for safety and control area, we act as a challenge function. Request will always be, show me how you are meeting requirements. The discussion will focus on key questions such as, has the applicant established a clear understanding of the potential risks and, and related uncertainties? What is the safety significance of those risks? And how are they preventing and mitigating those risks? We will ask questions about how the applicant safety claims are being supported, and we will examine the evidence. Regulatory research activities and talking with other regulators who have looked at these approaches before can and will be leveraged to supplement our work. But beyond technical considerations, Indigenous consultation for a specific project as well as ongoing pub public consultation will also identify factors that need to be considered in making licensing recommendations to the Commission. Finally, the licensing hearing process itself allows the Commission opportunities to hear from a broad set of stakeholders. This may result in additional factors that the Commission may direct the licensee to consider. But in the end, DNSC can make all the recommendations it needs, but the Commission ultimately makes the decisions. Next slide. Taking one quick step back into what the CNSC staff do when they assess a proposal by an applicant, the requirements and guidance in our regulatory framework always form a starting point for the assessment of, their, of the provisions, regardless of the novelty of a technology. We have established requirements and guidance for all of the safety and control area topics. They're based on proven fundamental safety principles that have been adopted all over the world that are as technology neutral as possible. Requirements must be achieved to demonstrate that an appropriate level of safety has been met to a high degree of confidence. Next slide. 
The obvious question that gets asked is, SMRs represent new technologies, so how do you assess adequacy of the technologies being proposed? Our regulatory framework allows for innovation, but will not allow safety to be compromised. The applicant is required to submit a body of evidence that proves the effectiveness of the technologies in consideration of the people that interface with them. The greater the importance to safety, the higher the burden of proof is required. Where there are technological knowledge gaps, an applicant will be expected to propose ways to compensate for those uncertainties until the gaps in knowledge are sufficiently addressed. They range from things like limits to, how long, uh, limits to operation of the facility, more conservatism in the design to address additional testing and inspection of systems, and CNSC staff can also conduct additional compliance oversight of the licensee. CNSC staff are also long aware that there's a lot of public interest in how waste from nuclear power projects will be managed over the long term and how decommissioning of these new types of SMR technologies will proceed. CNSC has recently republished its requirements for radioactive waste management and decommissioning in, in Canada under a framework for radioactive waste management and decommissioning. And, that in, and the, the framework reinforces expectations by the CNSC for upfront planning by vendors and licensees. In our technology reviews, we will actually look at some of the technological approaches that a vendor is considering in their design to actually facilitate uh, more efficient decommissioning and reduction of radioactive waste. And finally, I've left uh, the audience with a, a number of additional useful CNSC web links on this slide. I would invite everyone to go to the CNSC's website and look, look around. There's a wealth of information to offer. Uh, and I'd like to, uh, we're of course uh, open to answering any questions that you might have after this session. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marcel. That brings the end of our presentations, and we have lots of great questions coming in from the audience members. So we've got about 29 more minutes that we can spend talking and answering questions from the group. Um, but I first just want to say thank you so much to Marcel and John and Deanne for coming and sharing uh, the information today. It's been so wonderful to get this SMR sort of 101 level to kick off this series. We're going to dive deeper in the next three sections. Um, and um, John, when you put up your slide about all of the different companies uh, that have SMR technologies that we're talking about today in Canada, I was really excited because we'll have um, nine of those companies actually present specifics about their style and their approaches, um, the, the technologies themselves on March 7th. Second. Uh, so that's going to be really exciting uh, for that one. But let's dive into some questions. Uh, Deanne, I think I'd love to kick you off with one here. Um, uh, a person, Uduak Akpen from Canadian Nuclear Labs and a PhD research student on SMRs at the University of Alberta has a great question. Um, and asks, as SMRs are being developed for the Canadian energy sector, are end-of-life waste management and disposal considerations also being made? Uh, do you think including this information in our stakeholder engagement um, would be something that we'd need to do? So maybe, Deanne, I can pass it over to you. And I don't know if Marcel or John, you might want to um, chat about that as well. Absolutely, I'm happy happy to kick us off on this one, and I'm sure both uh, both Marcel and John will have uh, more info to add. Um, Candace, I actually have an annex slide that might be helpful to the audience. It's slide number twenty in my deck um, uh, that could support uh, support our our discussion on this. I, the Let first thing to pull that up for you, Deanne. Is that, uh, great. Uh, but I, I can start addressing the question while you're pulling that up. Uh, the first thing to know is the top public policy question that we had in the federal government of Canada when we convened the SMR roadmap in 2018. The project in 2018 was really the, uh, our analytical piece. In the government of Canada, we saw this wave of innovation, this technology that was being developed, and we had a lot of questions. We were really real. How, you know, how much are they going to cost? 
can they compete on levelized cost of electricity? Kind of waste that we're going to produce, and are we going to? How are we going to manage that? Is our current plan for a deep geological repository going to meet the needs and be able to deal with these new waste streams? Uh, we wanted to know how they're going to be regulated and whether or not our regulator was ready, and we wanted to know the views of Canadians indigenous people across Canada. Um, those were our big questions. And we took 10 months. We did expert analysis. We had uh, expert working groups on these big five questions. We had technical workshops across the country, and we had engagement sessions with Canadians and Indigenous people. And we summarized what we heard report that is available and still relevant, very much relevant today at smrroadmap.ca. And so if you want to see uh, more detail than we can provide you in our quick chat today, I encourage you to check out that report. It's very it's very readable. It was meant to be a report out to Canadians on these big questions, including waste. So a couple of things to note. What we learned through that process and what we have um, been continuing to, to monitor and ensure is that, number one, our legislation and regulations and standards in Canada uh, for the management of radioactive waste from our existing fleet uh, is um, is sufficient and and ready for SMR waste streams. So, under Canadian legislation, uh, we have created an organization called the Nuclear Waste Management Organization, and they are mandated in legislation by the federal government to design and implement. Canada's plan for the safe long-term management of all used nuclear fuel, not only from our can-do reactors or research reactors at different campuses, but also future fuel, uh, used fuel from SMRs. Uh, the NWMO is working on a deep geological repository. Uh, in 2010, they launched a process to identify a willing host community for Canada's deep geological repository. And over 20 years, voluntarily came forward to be considered as the site of Canada's deep geological repository. Over the course of the next 10 years, there's been this very thoughtful, highly uh, engaged pro with the communities to sort of whittle down that, that list and start to identify the most viable and the, the most likely sites. In 2020, the NW announced the top two sites, and uh, they started digging boreholes to do the geological analysis. So this is a very thoughtful, both scientific process, but also a highly uh, public-facing and engaged process to identify the site. And the site will be selected by 2023. And um, SMR uh, projects, like any nuclear project in Canada, you're licensed from the CNSC, the reactor on. You already have to have an end of life cycle plan in place and end of life cycle management. So you cannot even turn on your reactor or your SMR and you do, until you have put aside the monies and have the plan uh, uh, for how you're going to, and it will go into our deep geological. Room. And, and maybe I'll just stop there as well. Um, Candace? Maybe I could yes. just to add to, if I could just add to that very quickly. I mean, Deanna's done such a, a great job of, uh, you know, looking at the very procedural part of this and, and how uh, safely spent fuel is, is managed and the plans for the permanent uh, repository. But just a couple of little points of interest that I like um, bringing up when we talk about waste, which is, always um, top of mind with people who are getting to know nuclear. And the first is uh, how little waste, how little spent fuel um, nuclear produces. Uh, if you can imagine, uranium is a million times more energy dense than, let's say, coal. So imagine that. Uh, we've been providing two thirds of Ontario's electricity for more than 60 years. And the amount of spent fuel, because it's so uh, energy dense, would literally only fill up a, a handful of um, hockey arenas to the, the, the boards. Um, and in the case of small modular reactors, uh, it's, it's a much, much smaller even amount of waste that is, um, uh, that is produced. Some of the designs are actually fueled uh, in the manufacturing setting and, and shipped out to site 
uh, and don't have to be refueled for a decade and in some cases two decades. So there's not a lot of activity going along uh, uh, with, a, with a lot of these, um, these particular uh, technologies. And very exciting, uh, while this is just um, in the early stages, but a number of the technologies actually use spent fuel from our CANDU reactors as their fuel. So while this isn't a, a solution for all of the uh, all of the spent fuel produced by the Candy reactors, and we need the the permanent uh, solution, it's it, it is an exciting development, which means that some of the spent fuel becomes uh, not only recycled but a pretty valuable commodity. Thanks, John. I want to get in. I've noticed it, and I think this is indicative of Alberta. We like to kind of cut to the chase and talk numbers. Um, and so I wanted to tee up. There's a handful of questions that have come in around, tell me about the capital costs of, of nuclear. How does it compare um, to renewables, but also um, for electricity production? But then also, what are the capital costs and the operating costs um, in an oil sands or an industrial sort of sense? Will it be a, you know, a technology that is competitive? Um, so I, I'm hoping maybe, maybe John, could you kick us off? And then uh, Deanna, Marcel, if you've got any comments after. Yeah, so so uh, you know this is the this is the the big question, right? Um, and uh, the technology, uh, which is just now being developed and deployed, uh, you know, uh, it, the the numbers uh, the numbers are showing that it will be cost competitive with other sources of electricity uh, and heat generation. Uh, but the promise of small modular reactors and its ability to deliver on that really is going to have to do with um, uh, mass manufacturing and deployment, right? So the, the, the ability of small modular reactors to hit those promising uh, price points really does mean that we need to see these things uh, deployed at scale um, in a similar way to the way that we've seen, uh, you asked about renewables, you know, solar panels and wind turbines come down in cost, it's because of the mass manufacturing side of things. Uh, with regard to sort of the operating costs, um, one of the reasons that the small modular reactors uh, can be economic, in addition to being in, you know, produced in a manufacturing um, uh, situation instead of being a large infrastructure project, is because these things uh, essentially do not, many of the, the technologies do not require human intervention, right? They're fully, they're fully automated and they've got you know, enhanced uh, safety uh, you know, uh, uh, features built in as, as a result of that. So, um, so the cap, uh, the, the, the ongoing uh, operating costs is very, very much lower than, um, than you'd, you'd see with conventional plants. So I hope that's a, a, that's a bit of a framing of the, the, the cost answer. Uh, you know, we're not, we're not going to see whether we hit those, those numbers until uh, we see how, how nations like Canada and, and the U.S. and other places uh, do in terms of deploying these things. Go Maybe ahead, Deanne. I, I could jump in. Maybe I could jump in with a bit more information on this as well. Uh, the first thing is, I did notice that in the Q and A window of uh, of this uh, session, there's a lot of questions. So you're absolutely right. Um, Albertans clearly do want the numbers because there's a lot of people asking. Tell me what the levelized cost of like capital costs are. How much are these? Things? So people obviously have an appetite for numbers. So um, I would recommend. Uh, Canada's SMR roadmap. So in addition to the action plan, which is smractionplan.ca, please check out Canada's roadmap, which you can find at smrroadmap.ca. And there's a summary report, but there's also, for those who are really interested in the underlying analysis and want to see what the assumptions were for the economic analysis, there's the detailed economics analysis by the working group. Um, but in a nutshell, what I would say is that all, yes, uh, they have to be proven out and the costs will come down by uh, deployment of, uh, you know, enables learning by doing. So the cost will come down from that first one that we built. 
uh, but based on a bunch of very conservative assumptions, because the last thing we wanted to do in the federal government was uh, have rose-colored glasses in the strategic policy framework. Duties. So we made, we insisted on a series of very conservative assumptions, and the, in a nutshell, the findings were that uh, SMRs are expected to be cost competitive on the basis of levelized cost of electricity in some, but not all, markets. So, for example, uh, competing with uh, with diesel off grid in Canada is the most cost competitive market for obvious reasons. And there, we could reasonably expect to see twenty to sixty percent cost savings. The sensitivity about whether it's twenty to sixty percent depends in part on some of the design features of the SMRs, but in large part on the discount rate, so the cost of capital. And um, on uh, for on grid size SMRs, here we see a range of scenarios where SMRs could be competitive. They are unlikely, so not likely to be competitive on the basis of levelized cost of electricity with in. in in a market like where they're competing with large hydro in the province of Quebec. However, in other markets, including in markets like Alberta and Saskatchewan, where SMRs would be competing with natural gas, even with a moderate price on carbon, which was a bit of a surprise to be competitive in some scenarios. The, the cost analysis, there was also quite a bit of sensitivity analysis, um, sensitivity analysis around the economies of multiples and how quickly we learn by doing. And there we did some benchmarking against other sectors like um, shipbuilding and aerospace and other similar types of uh, large uh, modular main um, and we found that uh, the sensitivities in cost were really the most sensitive factor was cost of fuel. So at a 6% discount rate, uh, they're very competitive in many markets. At a 9% discount rate, the uh, LCOE for SMRs becomes a little bit more challenging. That's just, you know, for those who are really wanting to get into the numbers, if that kind of didn't um, uh, uh, give you your fix, definitely dive into the economics uh, roadmap report. Thanks, Deanne. You know, there's a lot of questions around safety and Marcella, you know, having your presentation about the regulator and the perspective and, and what needs to happen um, in Canada to, to approve technology development and deployment is, is so appreciated. But folks still are, are sending in a lot of questions. How safe are these types of technologies in close proximity to communities? Um, there's a similar question uh, about, you know, within the boundaries of large cities. Could these technologies be considered safe enough to participate in, um, you know, in that remote uh, powered and heat generation, but also in a distributed energy generation? Um, so, you know, Deanne, while we've got you, maybe you could start off and then and then head over to Marcel for some comments. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I, I, I won't speak long on this one because I really think you should hear from the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. And, and John may also have some uh, some perspectives on this. Uh, but look, one of the we have collectively as a global community of practice in nuclear. And I mentioned at the beginning that Canada is part of an elite group with the type of scientific and engineering um, expertise that we have in Canada in nuclear. And um, we have collectively learned a great deal from the last seven decades of uh, operations, research and development. Um, and that body of experience has informed a number of lessons learned and is really driving um, a new wave, kind of what we're calling next generation or generation four uh, nuclear innovation. So this wave of technologies that's, that's uh, being developed for 2020 30s is is next generation technology and it is we've taken the lessons learned from those seven decades of experience and there's a quantum step there's a there's a simplification in many of the designs that simplifies the safety uh, parameter safety or you'll hear people talk about uh, intrinsic safety or passive safety, uh, and, and that's a whole um, area of work that we can unpack and, and kind of tease out how the scientists achieve this, but, 
But the bottom line is that uh, they do have dramatically simplified and enhanced safety features, which is what uh, which is what people want. It's what communities want. It's what the operators want, uh, and it's what's really it's one of the main driving forces behind it. Thanks, Deanne. Maybe Marcel, yeah, can so we go over this to you? Marcel the boss again from this. Uh, sure. Uh, th this is one of those subjects where I could probably talk for about an hour, but uh, we'll try to cut it down to 30 seconds or less. Is uh, when we when a new technology is introduced, we were we are seeking assurances that that the requirements are ultimately met. And what we're looking for, for instance, is uh, a high degree of certainty that the design will be able to cope with anything that the site and the region will throw at it. Whether it is the potential for uh, internal accidents within the plant uh, to things that can hit it from the outside, namely, you know, uh, tsunamis, earthquakes, things like that. We have a very, in the first license normally submitted by an applicant, this is called a license to prepare site. That plus the environmental assessment will perform a pretty intensive review of the site conditions that are being chosen. So if a reactor is proposed to be put within city boundaries, we're going to have to understand how that facility will be sufficiently uh, capable of withstanding anything that could come in that uh, could result in a release to the population. Okay? And these releases, uh, we seek to eliminate them, and that is built in with to our regulatory framework. So the licensees are expected to follow a very detailed defense in depth approach with multiple barriers within the design as well as the way they operate the plants to ensure that there will be no large releases from these facilities. The siting process is usually the best way to choose where a power plant might be uh, sited, and the public will be part of that process, and they'll be able to ask questions of the license of the applicant on how it is that they're ensuring that putting it near a city uh, will result in a sufficient degree of safety. We will not license that facility if it cannot be demonstrated. If I might put it bluntly. Thanks, Marcel. John, did you want to comment at all on on the you know position of, of safety and, and thoughts around communities? I, I don't think so. I think Marcel and Dan have really uh, really covered all, all bases. Thanks, John. <laughs> I think we've got time for a couple of more questions. I, I did want to um, link a couple of questions that co have come in around, you know, if if these sorts of technologies um, start becoming a reality in Canada, are deployed, what are the, the transition skill sets that are going to be needed um, to, to start um, seeing these technologies proliferate? proliferate in, in different opportunities. Um, how, how can Albertans prepare? And, and what kind of timeline do we think we could see technologies like this land in Alberta? So I, I can take a, I can take a first I don't know step at that. that. Do you want to go first? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll I'll, uh, I'll go first. Thanks, Deanne, and and then I'll uh, pass it over. So I just want to highlight a couple of the key uh, the, the key milestones that we're aiming for as a, an industry. I think they've been mentioned in in uh, Deanne and, and Marcel's uh, presentations, but we expect that uh, the the very small reactors, and so these these ones, uh, you know, maybe. Uh, two, two megawatts and, and, you know, they're modular, so they're stackable up to 10 megawatts or something like that. I'm, I'm thinking of like a, a Westinghouse of Vinci, for example. Um, industry is targeting to have the first of those deployed by about the 2026 timeline. So that's much closer than many people expect. And of course, Ontario Power Generation has announced that it will connect its first small modular reactor at its Darlington site in 2028, uh, Saskatchewan is going to be um, following, you know, on its heels. So, so th those give you some some general markers in terms of when the, the first ones are being deployed. 
Uh, there are dis uh, very active discussions going on right now between uh, the nuclear industry and the oil sands uh, industries. I think Alberta Innovates is, is playing an important role here, but COSIA in particular is working with our industry going over the technical requirements now and looking at some of the uh, so some of the um, some of the market requirements, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I expect that the oil sands is going to be one of the very first uh, sectors that is going to see these uh, small modular reactors um, deployed. Uh, and, and I would think it with some, with some volume. Um, so we would be looking, I imagine, towards the end of this decade uh, to see some of those uh, units placed in, in the oil sands. And uh, there's huge potential there. I'll just flag for all of the uh, listeners here that the Canadian Nuclear Association, our organization, is going to be releasing some uh, modeling uh, that has looked at uh, the deployment of small modular reactors uh, in the oil sands. And I think um, that'll give you a better sense of uh, sort of penetration and timing. So that will be out in the coming days. So if I could uh, add on to that, first I'd like to actually, I, I neglected to say the most obvious thing in response to the previous question about safety, which is Canada's safety record. So we have uh, an impeccable safety record. We have three of the best uh, nuclear operators uh, in the world here in Canada that are regularly peer reviewed through IAEA, which is the International Atomic Energy Agency, that highest level uh, oversight uh, uh, body that comes in and reviews not only our regulator, but the operations at our nuclear power plants regulator. And we have excellent nuclear operators in Canada that have maintained just an extraordinary safety record in Canada. So when I talked about enhanced safety for SMRs, we're really talking about taking a very safe, like empirically proven, very safe track record and, and bringing it up even more. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure I, I kind of, I realized after I answered the question that I didn't say the most obvious thing. Um, on this question of what can Albertans do to get involved? and how can Albertans derive the most value in Alberta and create jobs in Alberta for Albertans as the SMR opportunity unfolds, please, uh, all of you should check out Canada's SMR Action Plan. So that's smraction.ca, and there you will be able to see uh, all of the. Uh, it's it's like a it's a directory of who's who in the SMR space in Canada, and it's an inventory for Canadians and for yourselves of who's doing what on SMRs. And there are a couple key players that I'd like to draw to your attention. Um, the Organization of Canadian Nuclear Industries, OCNI. So that supply chain uh, organization for Canada. And they are running a series of workshops. They've already had one with Saskatchewan. Um, and they're doing work in New Brunswick. Uh, to answer the question specifically of how do you retool an existing heavy industry supply chain to help them become part of the nuclear supply chain because there are some extra requirements if you want to become a nuclear supplier. And I know that the president of that organization would be very interested in speaking with Albertans uh, and Albertan supply chain companies about what it's going to take and how to get there so that when uh, Alberta uh, is ready to deploy SMRs, you've got some jobs uh, in the supply chain in Alberta. That's one aspect. Another aspect is what John's already mentioned, COSIA. Uh, but there are others also. I would encourage you to get in touch with COSIA and also COG, which is the Canadian uh, Can Do Owners Group. It's a bit of a, uh, they need a new name because they're more than Can Do now. They're Can Do and SMR. So COG, uh, COG is working with COSIA. They have a series of workshops coming up where they're going to be looking at uh, uh, requirements for heavy industry in Alberta. But there's other events that are coming up too, and you can sort of see an accounting of all of this in the action plan. For example, the mayors of some of the key jurisdictions in Saskatchewan and Alberta are going to be having a workshop with the mayors from existing nuclear jurisdictions in Ontario and New Brunswick, where they're going to talk about what does it mean to be a municipality that has nuclear in your perspective of public income many things that, that uh, there's so many ways to get involved and make sure that uh, the needs of Alberta are being factored into decisions that are and also that uh, there's work being done to make sure that you capture jobs and value in Alberta. So if you, you know, check out the website, but at the bottom of the website, there's an email address and you can always just email us and ask us how you can get involved. 
um, and tell us about your organization and your interests, and we'll try to match you up with the right players uh, in the action plan team uh, to make sure that, that this works for Alberta too. Thank you so much, Diane. Thank you, John. Thank you, Marcel, for being here today. We've got one minute left and I want to wrap up quickly. So we're going to be continuing this webinar series every week for the next uh, three weeks after this and diving deeper. I noticed so many technical questions coming in about candy reactors and ramp up times and pressures and all these sorts of things. Join the session on March 2nd when we've got all of the tech developers to talk about those sorts of things. If you're looking for bright spots and lessons learned and how things are moving and shaking, um, the folks from the government of New Brunswick, New Brunswick Power, Ontario Power Generation, uh, Saskatchewan, um, uh, Government of Saskatchewan and the innovation centers around there, they're all going to come and talk next week. So there's a great opportunity to dive deeper and continue these conversations. There are going to be resources for you. And so um, following this, we will send out a link where you can find the webinar recordings, the presentations. We've got reports and links and all kinds of good stuff. If you want to dive deep, uh, we've got information for you. Alberta Innovates has done their own research into opportunities in the oil sands. So if you really want to dive deep there, um, it will be uh, lots of reading for you to do. So thank you for joining us today. We are out of time, but we will see you next week. Don't forget to register for the next session and uh, can't wait to talk to you all again soon. Goodbye.